It's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and we'll start with listed questions. And I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Yep. Uh, question number one, Mr. Speaker. I can't call your uh, speaker with your permission. I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. In keeping with the community-based ethos of the Social Investment Fund, Sonal Steering Groups made the final decisions on projects selected for their area plans. Individuals or groups involved with concepts which did not make it into the area plans were advised at the time by the consultants appointed to support the steering groups or the steering groups themselves. Those area plans were submitted in February 2013. When the zonal allocations were subsequently announced, the steering groups were asked to prioritise their area plan projects within their assigned uh, budget. This process was completed by November 2013, and it was the responsibility of the steering group to inform those involved of the decisions made. If some individuals or groups are indicating they have not been informed, then they should contact the, re Sorry. They should contact the respective steering group, details of which are available on the OFMDFM website. Details of the chosen projects are also available on the OFMDFM website. And I call Mr. Elliott for a supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, Junior Minister for that. Um, is the, has the Office of First and Deputy First Minister no responsibility at all then for those early projects uh, that didn't progress in the scheme to actually inform them? Was that entirely up to the steering group or the consultants? Well, the member would know that basically um, from the, the initial stages of the Social Investment Fund, it was always led by the community and the statutory and those organisations that were designed from the bottom up. So, I mean, obviously um, there is a, a steering board there, or there's a board there, a SIF board there. So the, the, they were really the ones who would have been primarily responsible for informing those projects, those community-based projects, um, whether they were uh, successful or not. So it was really up to the steering group to inform them, um, rather than OFM, DFM. I call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In respect of any um, group that has been allocated funding, what, is there a timeline for those groups to be issued with their letters of offer and what is the process in respect of that? Well, the member would know that um, there were uh, 24 letters of offer um, that, that were put, put, or sorry, 23, which um, went up to 24 letters of offer who went out um, uh, last year. And then again, we have um, this, uh, I think it was the 20th of January, there were other projects, there, are, um, four, or there were nine projects altogether that were approved and the letters of offer of four of those have went out. So, I mean, we try to do it as quickly as possible from the time the, the process um, at the, the, the final stages when the project is approved. Then we try to get the letters of offer out there as quickly as possible. And then obviously to progress the whole project in, in a sense of the money and everything else to it. So while there, there might be a dedicated timeline as such, we do try to do it, it's, but it all has to be part of the process. And that's, that's the way the process has to um, evolve, if you like. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, does she accept that the level of information flow from the Office of First and Deputy First Minister made it extremely difficult for the area steering groups to update uh, applicants in relation to the scheme and declare an interest as a member of an area steering group? Well, I, th I think again, you know, I mean, if, if there have been difficulties and problems, um, I certainly look into that. I'll give the, the member the commitment to look into that. But really, you know, I mean, in the initial announcement, for instance, of the approved projects in February 2014, um, once the, the economic appraisal is completed and once the project is approved, then, you know, we do it as quickly as possible to get the letter of offer out there. But there is a, 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 there is, um, a, a point where, where it comes to the actual SIF steering group, which the member has said he is a member of, and you know I have some knowledge of the steering group even in, in my own local area, and I think that, that then that, that group there, then it's the onus is on that group then to actually inform the local projects um, that, that are part of the whole, the, the rest of the, the bigger project. But certainly, I mean, I take on board what you're saying, and I certainly look into it. And if you know there has been some issues there, I'll certainly talk to the member um, outside of question time today on that. I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. 
Speaker Mayogata, can I ask the Minister for her view on, on the tabling of an amendment to the budget last week by the Ulster Unionist Party, which effectively would have seen finance to the Social Investment Fund reduced? Well, again, um, uh, I must say that, that I was somewhat dismayed by the Ulster Unionist Amendment to the budget because it effectively what it did was to sought to take the money from the Social Investment Fund, a fund which will ensure at a very grassroots community level that a realisation of area plans that local steering groups deemed appropriate and prioritised according to need within their zone. And, you know, I think that, that really, you know, um, it is the right thing to do, and I think that, that the, even in this assembly, we have talked about it uh, on numerous occasions, to work with uh, communities in partnership with communities, and in this case, the steering groups, um, to ensure that we get these projects right and maximise the impact that they do. You know, uh, but the, the main point for me is these projects were actually um, designed and these projects were actually chosen from the community up, and I think that it's very, very essential that, that we listen to what the local community needs because indeed you know it's only people who live in those areas who work in those areas um, have a stakeholder uh, sense of those areas that they know what they need and in my opinion we should be we should be listening to what the community needs and I, I have to say I was quite dismayed whenever that amendment came forward I call Mr Colin Eastwood. Thank you Mr Speaker I can thank the Minister for her answers thus far um, Given the, the recent proposals on the reduction of departments and the, the rejigging of the executive, um, is there any plans to move the social investment fund to a department uh, that many people would have felt that it should have been in before, a department that has direct responsibility for disadvantage in our communities? Well, I think that the member, no, there's no plans for, for the first um, instance in your, in your question, but I think basically, I mean, the Social Investment Fund and those area plans did never worked in isolation of other community-based planning that was already there, including neighbourhood renewal. I know that, that very closely in some areas, some of the neighbourhood renewal partnerships worked on the steering groups and, and vice versa. So I think that, that there was already a joint up um, a sense of it whenever the social investment fund was first sort of uh, initiated and designed and I think that continues to be the case. I mean community planning as I said in the, in the last answer, community planning has to come from the people who live and work in those communities and ha who have uh, a stake in those communities. It can't be something that's put down from the top um, to, to tell people what they need. People in those communities need to need to choose and need to, to bring forward projects and proposals. And I think there is an interlinkage between all those other um, community planning um, groups and boards that are already there. Thank you. And uh, can I inform members that question three has been withdrawn within the appropriate uh, time frame. And can I call Mr. Marcino Mueller? Uh, question two. Uh, the situation in Syria has become one of the greatest humanitarian challenges of our time. Despite very significant humanitarian contributions from the international community, the pressure of over three million refugees is taking its toll on Syria's neighbours. These pressures are severely damaging the quality of life for ordinary people. While resettlement could never help as many as aid has, we recognise the need in common humanity for us to explore what we can do to make a difference for the most vulnerable. Accordingly, we are engaged in exploratory discussions with the Home Office, other devolved administrations, other government departments and relevant non-governmental organisations about whether there is a role that we can play. I feel that we should respond positively to the call for help by the United Nations Refugee Agency. Germany has offered 30,000 places and the Irish Government has committed 300 places. Sadly, the Government in London has not yet committed to take refugees, but I note that Scotland are appealing to them to allow refugees to come to Scotland, and I feel that we should do likewise. In such uh, circumstances, uh, we would of course speak to the British Government about funding for such uh, an initiative. Deputy First Minister agree that the benefits 
uh, to Belfast, uh, or certainly to, to the north of taking refugees, would also be considerable that it would be a blessing to Belfast to be able to take in uh, refugees from Syria, and of course it would be a lifeline to those in greatest need in the refugee camps. Well, I, I know that both uh, the, the member and Reverend uh, Bill Shaw have written to uh, the First Minister and myself about what is a, a catastrophic situation in uh, Syria in relation to uh, how we here in the North can hold out uh, the hand of support to people who are going through uh, incredible trauma in their lives. Uh, the reality is that according to United Nations uh, figures, uh, something in the region of uh, between 190,000 to maybe even more than 200,000 people have been killed in Syria as a result of the conflict. And of course, uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, unreservedly condemn uh, the murder of two Japanese citizens by ISIS over the course of recent days, and, and to share our sympathy to the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in relation to uh, that situation. But of course, these uh, situations are, are highlighted as individual tragedies for families, and the effect of all of that is seen all over the world. Yet, when you look at a figure of something like 200,000 Syrians who have lost their lives, it really brings home how uh, terrible the situation is in that country. So I think the fact that it is now being explored uh, in relation to other nations uh, bringing people who have been affected badly by the ongoing conflict in uh, Syria, I think it is important that we here in the North, uh, if, if it is at all possible, uh, make our own particular contribution. And I think that would send out a very powerful message about uh, our uh, where our sympathies lie in relation to how this terrible conflict has affected ordinary people. Thank you. And I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly welcome the question from the member from South Belfast. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister, given, and he's given very stark figures in his responses, given the ever increasing persecution of Christians, and especially, has there been any discussion? with the London government or Dublin government to ensure that we do have the capacity to take that leadership role of encouraging and motivating those refugees to come here? Well, I, I think the, the discussions that have taken place thus far have taken place in the context of the question asked by the original question asked by the member. Uh, and there are discussions taking place between uh, our officials and the government in London and other devolved institutions. It, it's very, very uh, important that we do so, and, and it's very important that we also understand that you know, there's almost two conflicts happening in Syria. There's the internal Syrian conflict that has taken something like 200,000 lives, and then you have the activities of this barbarous group, uh, ISIS, who have been uh, targeting people uh, because those people have not signed up to uh, their jihadist uh, extremism, and of course a lot of people who were Christians and in other denominations in Syria have lost their lives at the hands of uh, this particular group. So this is a, a, an enormously complicated uh, situation. I, I have my own view that uh, a lot of what we're witnessing now had its roots in the invasion of Iraq, uh, which all of those who have studied the conflict, I think, have now come to acknowledge as uh, being at the the core of the trauma that people are suffering uh, at the moment, particularly at the hands of ISIS in relation to their activities both in Iraq and in uh, Syria. So yes, those discussions uh, will continue. Uh, we don't have any delusions of grandeur about how we can impact what we would do if we are able to do something will be symbolic, but I think it is important through a symbolic gesture to uh, send a message to the rest of the world that the rest of the world also needs to do something. Thank you. And I call Mr. David McLevine. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the First Minister, Deputy First Minister for his answers so far. Um, 
I, I also welcome the Deputy First Minister's uh, condemnation of the two murders of the hostages by ISIS uh, in Syria. Uh, also, there were at the tail end of last week two other murders which took place in Syria, which was the murder of two Israeli soldiers by Hezbollah in the southern part of Syria. I wonder would the Deputy First Minister join me in also condemning the murders of those two Israeli soldiers? Well, I think the, I mean, the First Minister and I have been uh, very focused over the course of the last number of years in various conversations that we've had uh, with people from what is also another conflict situation in a different part of uh, that region. And we have always been of a view that uh, the conflict there should be brought to an end, that the solutions can only be arrived at through dialogue and negotiation. And I absolutely do condemn the killing of Palestinians and the killing of Israelis. I think it's hugely important that all of us who, particularly we who have been through a very successful peace process and bringing an end to conflict on our streets, uh, reach out to people and to implore people to recognize that they can either resolve their conflicts now or they can wait for 10, 15, 20, 50 years during which time many hundreds of thousands of people uh, can be killed. Uh, and we can all engage in, in the condemnation of all of that. That isn't going to resolve the problems. What will resolve the problems is the willingness of people to come to the, the negotiating table and the willingness of the big powers to play their part in a constructive way to help bring these conflicts to an end. Thank you. And I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the reduction in the number of executive departments from 12 to 9 in time for the 2016 Assembly election is a commitment in the Stormont House Agreement. Subsequently, the executive agreed to commit to implementing the measures in the Stormont House Agreement at its meeting on the 15th of January. A proposed nine uh, departmental structure was presented to the executive on the 15th of January, and a further discussion was held on the 22nd of January when the executive agreed the number of departments and their functions. The only exception to this was the functions of OFM-DFM, which will be the subject of further consideration. Further detailed work on the functions allocated to each department can be carried out whilst working through the legislative process. The timetable for the implementation of the reduction in departments is extremely challenging. This is why we have taken key decisions as early as possible to allow as much time as possible for legislation to be progressed and the proper planning and implementation of this major change programme. Uh, we mustn't uh, underestimate the challenge that is ahead. We are trying to implement significant reform at a time when we are also reducing the size of the civil service. That uh, said, it also presents us with a huge opportunity to streamline the civil service and create better cohesion between and within departments, resulting in quality key services uh, being provided to citizens. Thank you, and Mr. Buchanan, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With the streamlining of the civil servants and the reduction in the government departments, does the Deputy First Minister agree that there is still time between now and the elections in 2016 to reduce the number of assembly members in this House? And is he both willing and has the appetite to take this through the executive? Well, I think that the member will be aware that there is a commitment in the uh, Stormont House Agreement for a reduction in the number of Assembly members for the election which will take place in 2021. Uh, and I think that uh, during the course of the Stormont House negotiations, uh, there were some parties who wanted that to happen uh, quicker than others. Uh, and I think that it was important during the course of that to try and get as much agreement as possible so that that would not become a matter of contention between us. So the Stormont House Agreement does refer to the challenge that's before uh, the parties uh, in this House uh, in terms of meeting that commitment. And uh, my sense of it is that given the spirit that has been apparent in the implementation meetings that the First Minister and I have participated in with other party leaders, it's, it's obvious to me that uh, all of this is uh, eminently achievable. 
Thank you. And the call, Mr. Ian Mullen. Uh, could I ask the, the, the Deputy First Minister what steps have been taken to ensure that the concerns of staff are addressed as this process moves on? Well, I think that is a very uh, important matter because the, the impact on staff has been an, an integral factor of the work to date. The head of the civil service is keeping staff regularly informed, and trade unions have also been consulted. That engagement will continue in the time ahead, and while we understand that there may be some uh, apprehension, particularly among staff within those departments, which will cease to exist, I would like to reassure them that the very valuable public services and functions that they deliver will continue, and every effort will be made to address any concerns which may emerge as the process uh, continues. Okay, and I call Mr. Jim Allister. Welcome as any reduction in the number of departments would be. What about the Department of O of M, DFM, addressing the squander in its own department on the excessive number of special advisers? The entire Welsh Government has eight special advisers. O of M, DFM has eight special advisers, costing us almost a million pounds a year. What is the need for that, and will that be addressed by means of reduction? Well, uh, obviously what we are all undergoing uh, as a result of the decision to reduce the number of uh, departments from 12 to 9 is, is a process of change. And I think in the context of uh, resolving, and it will be obviously more complicated resolving the situation within OFM, DFM in terms of what functions they retain or let go of, then in, in that context that is something that will obviously be uh, taken into consideration by the First Minister uh, and myself. Thank you. Patsy McGlown. While I am going to go to the first time, I will go to the first time. I will go to the first time. I to the first time. I will go to the first time. I will go or new issues indeed around North South cooperation has he in mind for the next agenda of the North South Ministerial Council? Well, I, th I think a member, as all members will be aware, that the issue of uh, North South cooperation uh, was a major subject of debate during the course of the Stormont House uh, negotiations. And uh, we have set ourselves uh, a work programme uh, which is about. Uh, agreeing for the purposes of the next meeting of the North South Ministerial Council how that will be further developed in the time ahead. So I am confident that uh, whenever the North South Ministerial Council meetings uh, takes place uh, in a few months' time, that uh, it will deal with the uh, work programme that will fall at its door as a result of the negotiations that we were involved in prior to Christmas. So I think that the challenges are, are there for all of us to see, and the head of the civil service in the south and the head of our uh, civil service uh, are very focused uh, and working together on an ongoing basis to ensure that we uh, continue to develop uh, relationships north and south. And one area which I think there has been a lot of focus on is the Northwest uh, Gateway. And the, the decision that has been made that there will be uh, very shortly a, a meeting of ministers uh, north and south to consider how to take what is a very important uh, project for, for all of us forward. Thank you. And I call Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wonder, can I ask the Deputy First Minister what discussions he's had with the, with the First Minister with regard to the future of OFM DFM, and in particular with it ceasing to be a service delivery a department and one that adopts a, a more coordinating approach? Well, the matters that the uh, member uh, referred to are presently under discussion uh, between ourselves in the Office of First and Deputy First Minister. I believe that they will be satisfactorily resolved and that we will see uh, a very smooth transition uh, through the uh, agreements that we have made in relation to, first and foremost, the reduction of the number, but also the functions of the departments. Obviously, OFM, DFM was always going to be a wee bit more complicated than the other departments, but uh, I do not see anything there that uh, will uh, in any way prevent us 
uh, reach an agreement as, how, as to how we, we will move forward. And of course, subjects under consideration are uh, will functions be retained? Will some functions go to other departments? Uh, what will be the overall role of the Office of First and Deputy First Minister in relation to how we take all of this forward? So uh, that's still a work in progress, and uh, I, I believe that uh, as we were successful uh, during the course of the Stormont House negotiations, I similarly believe that in the implementation of all of this that we will be equally successful. Thank you. Mr Oliver McMullen is not in his place for question five. And Mr. Sammy Wilson for question six, and uh, Mr. Stuart Dixon for number seven. So I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Question eight. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, in answer to question number four, the reduction in the number of civil service departments is a commitment in the Stormont House Agreement, uh, the implementation of which uh, has uh, since been agreed by the executive. A proposed nine departmental structure was presented to the Executive on the 15th of January, and on the 22nd uh, the, of January, the Executive agreed the number of departments and their functions. The only exception to this is the functions of OFM DFM, which will be the subject of further consideration. Further detailed work on the functions allocated to each department can be carried out whilst working through the legislative process. So we must not underestimate the challenge ahead, including the demanding timetable and the fact that this significant reform comes at a time when we're also reducing the size of the civil service. That said, it is also a huge opportunity to streamline and uh, create better cohesion between and within departments. And I'm very conscious that I've just repeated myself. <laughs> I'm very conscious that I've just repeated the answer from the earlier question. And call Mr Nesbitt for a supplement. Well, at, at the risk of further repetition, I want to acknowledge uh, the Deputy First Minister's comments to date, uh, not least on the future of OFM-DFM, which I acknowledge is under further consideration, apart from the other restructuring. But having worked in the department since uh, 2007, having been, been down the castle for that period of time, uh, the Minister must have formed some sort of opinion uh, on the way forward, and I just wonder whether he would be prepared to share that with the House? Well, I, I think that the most appropriate mechanism for taking this forward is to share my views and thoughts with the First Minister, and similarly he with me, which we do on a regular basis. And uh, I think that uh, obviously the challenge is for us to agree how this department will be taken forward. Uh, there are big challenges for us, but I believe that we will arrive at a satisfactory uh, conclusion. Uh, and I think that out of uh, respect for the implementation group, the ministerial subgroup that we established, which the member is uh, part of, it's very important that uh, rather than go public on how we envisage this being taken forward, that we do this in consort with our uh, colleagues in the ministerial uh, subgroup. Uh, and that includes the member who has just spoken. So I think out of respect for that group, it's important that whenever we reach a conclusion, that they are appraised of it before uh, the public are. Again, I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. August. And can I ask the Minister um, to uh, provide an update on the deliberations regarding what OFM, DFM functions can be dispersed to other departments, Gormagat? Well, uh, that sounds like an attempt to uh, compliment the, the earlier question from, uh, from the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. I think members know that there are sens sensitive and cross-cutting uh, matters within the uh, uh, OFM, DFM area of responsibilities. And, uh, the answer is that more consideration must be given to the appropriate uh, split of uh, functions to ensure that the optimum service is provided to uh, the public. So, as I've said, discussions are, are ongoing, and executive ministers have had the opportunity to review and comment on OFM DFM's current, current functions. So, we intend to bring a paper to the executive soon, articulating in more detail the proposed future responsibilities of uh, our department. So, I think that uh, for, for the time being, uh, that's as much as uh, we can put into the public domain. 
Thank you, and or that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Um, can I ask the Minister, the Deputy First Minister, would he agree that the inclusion of the words uh, culture and arts in the title of an executive uh, department signals Northern Ireland uh, as a place where crea the creative industry is welcome and that the loss of such a title uh, will cause uh, concern in the industry? Well, I think as a member knows, we are presently in the process of agreeing the names of the new departments. There obviously is going to be a huge change impacting on a number of departments. Whatever title we agree on, I think people can rest assured that the whole issue of culture and arts, and indeed many other aspects of government, that people may have concerns about in terms of whether or not those names appear in titles will be adequately dealt with by, the, uh, by not just the title of the department, but the way in which the department is then described by the particular department that has undertaken new responsibilities. So I think that from our perspective uh, at this stage, it, it's fair to say that uh, there are serious discussions taking place. All of the parties in this uh, House are represented on the, ministerial, the executive's ministerial uh, subgroup. And I think that the, uh, the titles that we finally agree uh, in, in many ways will deal specifically with the major responsibilities of that department, but also in the context of the outworking of those titles will be a very clear explanation where the responsibility lies departmentally for uh, aspects of government, uh, such as culture and arts. Thank you, Ms. Karen McEvitt, for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The proposed new Department of Social Welfare, Communities uh, and Sports will amalgamate functions of the DSD, DCAL, and some functions of uh, DAL. Could this move mean that the budget allocated to the arts and the creative sector will be further squeezed when competing for funds, uh, particularly in the department that would be responsible for the like of housing and benefits? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not going to go into detail about where areas of responsibility are moving from or to. Uh, that will become clear eventually, and this House will be notified. But I can assure the member that uh, we take very seriously, uh, first and foremost, the huge economic challenges that we're facing at the moment, particularly in the context of how our budget has been reduced by the coalition government at Westminster. At the same time, uh, we are very determined to ensure uh, that we provide uh, essential frontline services for everybody who makes a contribution to uh, the, the enrichment and enhancement of uh, our lives, including people who are involved in sport, people involved in culture, people who are involved in arts. So I do not believe that under any circumstances that the changes that will take place in relation to the, uh, the, the number of departments that that will in any way uh, inhibit uh, the ability of ministers to deliver for these uh, very important uh, aspects of all our lives. Thank you. And question two has been withdrawn within the appropriate uh, guidance. So I call Mr. Morris Devenny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask, does the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister have any plans to extend the Delivering Social Change Signature Project? on improving literacy and numeracy, which currently expires in several months' time. Uh, with your permission, Junior Minister McKeon will take that question. Well, the member will be aware that the Delivering Social Change Signature Projects, including the one that, that the member mentions, um, the literacy and numeracy ones, was quite very, very successful. And I can tell the member that we have, you know, um, and we are looking in the budget, um, in terms of obviously continuing that project on in this financial year and next financial year, we will be speaking and we have had um, conversations with the Department of Education and the Minister of Education on that. Um, obviously, delivering social change is a framework um, which uh, we're working within, but we would be hopeful that those uh, projects that were the signature projects, those six signature projects that were a success, that departments and ministers would look at their core budgets and see where they would fit into their core budgets and taking it forward. But certainly, um, uh, we, we are in uh, conversations with the Department of Education and the Minister uh, on that specific topic. Thank you. Mr. Devenny for a supplementary. 
Um, I first of all thank the Minister for her answer. Um, would the Minister agree that if this project was minded not to be ex extended, it would have a detrimental effect on our schools? Well, I would certainly agree that, that you know, this was a very successful project. Um, myself and Junior Minister Bell actually went out to several schools and visited the schools that this project and the Nurture Group projects, part of the signature projects as well, were in place. And I have to say, just talking to the, some of the, the new teachers that were brought in and to the pupils and to the teachers, um, we would certainly be um, confident that, you know, as an executive, that we would be very, very mindful that when we do um, put in place something that works and actually is beneficial to those young children and to the schools and to um, you know, their, their educational needs, that certainly we would be looking to actually make sure that that is continued. Thank you. And I call Mr Dahi Mackay. Uh, can, I can I ask the Deputy First Minister if you could provide an update on the progress being made uh, on the implementation of the various commitments contained within the Stormont House Agreement? Well, as famously uh, Senator George Mitchell once said, it's one thing uh, making an agreement, it's a whole other exercise implementing it. And uh, if that was true in the context of the various agreements that we've been through in the past, it's also true of the Stormont House Agreement. But I have to say I'm tremendously encouraged by the uh, attitude and spirit of all of those who have a duty and a responsibility to uh, implement the agreement. As I said earlier uh, at the executive, it was put to the executive that uh, all ministers uh, should endorse uh, the implementation of the agreement, and all of the ministers did. Similarly, the First Minister and I have been involved in two meetings of the uh, implementation group, and just last Friday we met with the, both the British and the Irish governments. And, uh, from our perspective, I think we're, we all recognise that good work has been done. Uh, we all recognise the uh, huge challenges that uh, implementing this agreement has for all of us. But I think you know, there were various correspondents prior to Christmas saying there wasn't a snowball's chance in hell of us getting an agreement. Uh, and yet we have uh, reached a comprehensive uh, agreement. Uh, I would have liked it to have been even more comprehensive than what it is, but the reality is that uh, we have uh, reached uh, an agreement on the way forward, and people have set about the work in a very serious-minded way. Important decisions are being made. We've spoken about some of them here in the course of today, for example, in relation to the reduction in the number of departments, the commitment to deal with the number of assembly members by uh, 2021, uh, the whole issue of how we protect people on welfare benefits who would face the brunt of the austerity agenda being deployed uh, by London. I think excellent work was done in relation to that, and people will see the outworking of all of that in the time ahead. Uh, and of course, uh, in the intervening period, we, we have had you know, people two, trying two to scare up, longer in relation to uh, the voluntary exit strategy from the civil service or public service people talking about compulsory redundancies and sackings and so forth, none of which bear any uh, resemblance to the truth whatsoever. The process that we're involved in will be totally and absolutely voluntary. And uh, can I call Mr Mackay for supplementary? And just before, I'm informed that people at the back of the room are having difficulty. If uh, the ministers could uh, make sure that they're speaking into the mics and perhaps the sound engineers could just try and rebalance the, uh, the system to assist. Thank you. Sure, I, got a, I can't clear. Um, can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer? Can, can I ask the Deputy First Minister if he agrees that it's important to make progress swiftly uh, on the Stormont House Agreement to help retain the public's confidence in the Assembly and the institutions, but also to send out a positive message domestically and internationally? Well, I, th I think we're all agreed that unless we keep the timelines uh, and the uh, commitments that have been made in, in the agreement, then uh, the danger is that uh, forces outside of uh, these institutions will try to portray divisions amongst us. Uh, I haven't identified any divisions amongst us uh, thus far. So I am confident that uh, we will uh, manage to uh, keep to the commitments and the timelines that we have set ourselves. And the test of all of that will be 
very, very shortly within this assembly. So, First Minister and I are very focused. I believe that the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, the leader of the SDLP, the leader of the uh, Alliance Party are also very focused on ensuring that we implement uh, this agreement. And, and I think that uh, that's what people want to hear. People are fed up to the back teeth of controversy, uh, accusations that we can't take decisions. They want to see decisions being taken. We now have an agreement. And uh, I, who represent probably the most optimistic wing of the peace process, I'm confident that we can get this done. Thank you. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, just on the Stormont House Agreement, the Deputy First Minister indicated that he is optimistic and he was tremendously encouraged about the agreement. How does he see the timeline uh, unfolding over the course of the next 18 months? Well, I, I think that, that there are so many challenges uh, for all of us. Uh, the member mentioned the, the next 18 months. I mean, we've set ourselves a challenge to establish a commission we'll, which will look at the whole issue of flags and symbols and identity. Uh, and that has an 18 month timeline in relation to delivery from uh, sometime uh, around June of this year. Uh, there are also other challenges in relation to the timeline. Uh, I'm not going into the detail of, of all of them, but I mean, uh, it's quite clear that uh, one of the targets that we had to deal with was the passing of a budget in this assembly. Uh, another target is the passing of the uh, welfare approach, uh, which I, I think saw good work done between all of the parties in relation to how we protect the most vulnerable and disadvantaged within our society. And of course, huge challenges face all of us in relation to the establishment of the uh, bodies that will deal with uh, the past and so forth, uh, in terms of the HIU, ACIR, uh, and the uh, reconciliation and implementation group. So I think that uh, challenges are there, but thus far there's a commitment. It's obvious that there's a, a seriousness, and uh, we're looking to get this done within the time frames and timelines that we've set ourselves. Thank you. And Mr Campbell for a supplement. Um, given then that the Deputy First Minister is uh, tremendously encouraged and is optimistic, uh, and he mentioned the HIU. Is he now in the position then that is somewhat different to what he said a couple of years ago, where he said that he couldn't outline what he had been engaged in in the past, the murder, the attempted murder of dozens, if not scores, of innocent civilians and members of the security forces? That he now he said then that to do so would destabilise the institutions. Does he now feel confident enough that he can do it without any threat to stability? Well, uh, I, I should have, and I did, anticipate that, that a discordant note uh, would be sounded during the course of the debate, and I accurately predicted which member uh, would do that. I think during the course of his contribution, he may have uh, attributed remarks to me that I never made. But that said, uh, people should be assured that the commitment of myself and others uh, is for the implementation of this agreement. And I think that given the track record of the member in supporting British state forces in the past, it's, it's quite obvious uh, that the member himself has been very, very supportive of many of the activities of these people, which has resulted in many people losing their lives. Order, have you asked a question? Have the courtiers said you listened to the answer? Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the um, Deputy First Minister for an update on how his department is tackling sexual and domestic violence within Northern Ireland? Uh, Junior Mr. McCann will answer this question with her permission. Well, the member will know that there is um, a group now, a ministerial group, looking at domestic and sexual violence, and there's indeed a strategy there um, that that has the the, the there was consultation with many of the stakeholder groups um, in and around that, and I know that um, you know, there were some issues that people had with the strategy when it was first um, drafted, but I think that now you know, they're well um, into um, you know, incorporating that strategy now, and that strategy will be going forward, not just as a separate domestic violence strategy, but as a domestic um, violence and sexual violence strategy. And, uh, 
time just for a supplementary and hopefully the Minister would be keen enough to give you a written answer. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and um, thank the Junior Minister for her answer. Can, can she give us maybe some more detail about um, what protections within that strategy may be available for children living um, in households affected by domestic violence? Okay, order time is up. I'm afraid we must uh, now move on.